awesome. We start. Oh, you're in it. You're seeing what we're seeing. Okay, Nolan. Awesome. Hello, everybody. My name is Nolan Bunting. Um, before I begin, I also want to thank one of the people in the front row, Kara Moslin, for helping with this presentation. She's one of the other VetCast podcasters. And she did a lot of research into the corridor side of this presentation. So thank you for being here. Awesome. So let's begin by saying, next slide, please. Um, hopefully. Yes. So really quickly, I wanted to give a little bit about myself. So that way, beyond just the glorious introduction I was given, which was way, way too much, not too much information. But um, anyways, my name is Noam Bunting. I'm from Homer, Alaska, um, which is famous for our Homer Spit, which is kind of our number one birding area. Um, there, I worked with the Alaska Marine Sea Life Center doing marine standing networks, where I focused on otter epidemics, as well as focused on a lot of work on being with wildlife guide and venture, doing kayaking tours, bear guiding tours, and of course, birding tours. Um, I've been a CSU student for about past six years. This is my second year as a doctor of veterinary medicine student at CSU, where I worked with, uh, work with the VetCast, which is a podcast where we focus on emerging issues in animal health. Um, and, I, and I research a lot into how we relate biodiversity, wildlife pathology, and human health, as well as environmental health, kind of a focus on One Health, which will be a lot of this presentation. Last organization that I'd like to throw shout outs to, because I also work for them as a wildlife guide and educator, is Pivotal Places, which is a local nonprofit that focuses work on adapting conservation programs for communities in South Africa, for them to develop programs for kids to work and learn about how the environment works, as well as how the environment is beneficial for their conservation, for their communities and things. Awesome, next please. So before we begin, I always like to throw a roadmap so that way people know exactly where we're going to go down this wonderful adventure. So we're gonna start off with an introduction to what are known as ecosystem services. Now if that sounds like a big word now, don't worry, we're gonna cover it and look at it into a bit more smaller detail and then relate them to habitat corridors. Later in the presentation, we will cover One Health and the benefits of ecosystem health, which is the branch of One Health focusing on how we keep an ecosystem healthy and the benefits of keeping an ecosystem healthy. And finally, we'll finish off with some concluding remarks on how you guys can help with habitat corridors and any questions that you guys could possibly have for me. And I hope that you have as much questions as possible because I love questions. Awesome. So next, please. So let's talk a little bit about ecosystem services. I'm going to do a quick poll here. Who has heard of ecosystem services in this room? A lot less than I was expecting, actually. OK, cool. OK, so ecosystem <laughs> services are the benefits that we gain from protecting an ecosystem. Now, these benefits are both fiscal benefits in the terms of provisioning services such as wood, lumber, water, as well as regulating services that actually help with certain environmental disasters, and cultural services, which is our exercise and the non-material things we get from nature. So we'll go through each one of these and why each one works. So starting off, next please, we have our supporting services. So the way I think of supporting services is this is the glue that holds ecosystems together. Without supporting services, there would be no such thing as ecosystem services or an ecosystem at all. These services include the big ones that we all know and love a lot, being biodiversity, how diverse an ecosystem is, from looking at microbes all the way up to larger species. More biodiverse an ecosystem, the more ecological services it provides. Secondly, we have photosynthesis. And basically that nice food chain that we have, because the more we have a food chain, again, the healthier an ecosystem and the healthier an ecosystem, the more services we can get from it. And finally, we have nutrient and water cycling. These are the fundamental things that we're used to hearing about in our sixth grade class. Now, when you're in sixth grade, you probably heard the water cycle of a circular pattern, the water evaporates and then condenses and falls to the ground. 
Well, in reality, it's a lot more complicated than that. There's a lot of things like bleaching and soil mixture and how we have bioturbation and different animals that incorporate into this nutrient cycle. And this large scale nutrient cycle is what supports a lot of the ecosystem services that we have in the future. So moving on to the next part, going away from these supporting services, now we're going into the actual benefits to us, not so much the basic layout. So next slide, please. I like to start with the non-material stuff, the stuff that we get from an ecosystem that we're used to. Now really quickly, for this survey, I want to ask, how many of you guys are birders? Yeah, hopefully a lot of you guys are birders in the Audubon Society. And what is the thing that we love about birding? Well, we love going out into nature and exploring it and seeing it and getting the aesthetic appeal of seeing animals in the wild. That is a cultural aspect of ecosystem services. It's one of the things that when you're out in nature, it's something that the ecosystem gives to you. There's also education. This is us in South Africa, where we're working with kids and community leaders to talk about how we can promote education. When you're in an ecosystem, one of the best ways we found to teach kids about nature is to take them out into nature. Show them that this is what an elephant looks like. This is what you do when you're taking a soil sample. This is what we mean when we do a water test. And by doing this, having this educational benefit of the ecosystem to promote environmental systems and conservation, as well as push forward the need for education for large communities. And finally, when the cultural services is heritage. So heritage is an important thing for indigenous people, and it's also important for us. Whenever we're in nature, we go out in Fort Collins and we go, oh yes, this natural area is one that I've been exploring for 35 years. Or this area was used by Native Americans long ago to hunt bison. The one example that I always use is my good friend Thomas here, who is actually a wildlife guide in South Africa. And what he specializes in as a wildlife guide is the medicinal and poisonous uses of plants. And one of the things he talks a lot about is how through conservation, we conserve a lot of the native plants that he has used throughout his life and he cares a lot for. And because we can serve it and do that, he gets the services of using his culture and talking about his culture and keeping his culture alive. Awesome, next slide, please. So talking a little bit about keeping people alive, <laughs> this is the regulating services. These are the services that I love with ecosystem services because they directly impact us as people. Now, the three that I've chosen up here are actually very important for Colorado, but there's many other forms of regulating services, including water cycling, as well as nutrient cycling, and as well as air cycling, which is very important in places like New York, where they discovered that pollution can be reduced through trees that absorb carbon and that kind of thing and prevent smog. So, Let's talk a little bit about Colorado. So we have our first one that I want to talk about is erosion and flood control. Up the Poudre Canyon, we are very, we recently had a flash flood back in the early of the summer. And this was caused a lot by the wildfires degrading the trees. And this is because trees act as erosion barriers that prevent runoff and that kind of thing. So one of the things that ecosystems do with a large biodiverse ecosystem is they a lot prevent degradation of the soil by basically planting their roots in it, tying it up, bounding it together, which prevents runoff, as well as absorbing water. Trees, believe it or not, are alive, and they drink a lot of water. Shocker, they're like a giant straw. So as such, when water comes down, usually it gets cycled through the plant and doesn't necessarily lead into flash floods. It's the reason that flash floods are more common in arid environments where there aren't that many trees that are absorbing water, and there's also not a lot of roots that are binding and holding soil together in one spot. Now, the other side as well is carbon storage. And for this, I'm going to take you guys on the opposite side of Fort Collins out into the Pawnee National Grassland. The Pawnee, yeah. So the Pawnee is a grassland. What is famous about grasslands? Well, it's grass. What is one thing about grass that is fantastic? And that is the fact that it's a major carbon storage. As grass grows, it basically falls down on itself and then packs down into the soil and dirt. When you're digging through a soil sample, such as this one out in Pawnee, you'll find grass layers go down almost five feet into the soil. And that includes their roots, that includes if they were buried prior to soil exposure, 
And all that bearing is cycling the carbon that we produce through gasoline and fossil fuel emissions. They absorb that carbon dioxide and plant it into the soil, thus becoming what's known as a carbon sink. And this is one regulatory service that is very common throughout North America, including the areas of Alaska where we see it in permafrost. The final slide, which actually has its own slide as well, if you can go to the next, please, is talking about fire prevention. I wrote this before the fires happened in Boulder. And um, first off, my condolences to anyone that had friends or family in those fires. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about how ecosystem services help with fire control. Now, there are three major ways that we find that ecosystems help with fire control. The first is through fire breaks. One of the issues we had with the Boulder fire is that everyone, it happened in a very urban area. So the fire spread from house to house with no breakage in between. With ecosystem services, we find the fires are prevented through the planting of an ecosystem because in areas like Colorado, where we have a naturally fire resistant landscape with fire resistant plants, because they're used to these average daily fire cycling, or sorry, yearly fire cyclings that happen to them. You know, we have these breaks apart from what's, you know, flammable and not flammable. Additionally, one of the things that ecosystems provide is what's known as bare surface cover. When you're in a natural area such as Comanche National Grassland or in even one of our fossil, um, fossil creek reservoirs, you'll see that there are these patches of just dirt, which is caused by things like ants grazing or prairie dog poles these natural animals that are digging up and just grazing and that reduces the spread of fire through those landscapes because there's not as much to burn um uh, again uh yeah ecosystem services regulated services are very important for fire prevention and in colorado we even see that when we're dealing with old growth forests so in areas that we have afforestation and conservation, we often have fires that spread really quickly because there's a lot of trees and in many ways they're over-conserved. So we have areas that where fires are spread often. But when we start getting into the natural environment and uh, sustainable management being what we have with basically keeping houses and systems together, we have this balance of grazing and plants as well as houses and breaks that prevent fire from spreading really quickly and kind of controlled. On the far side, we can actually prevent fires completely by doing more exploitation, but we lose all the benefits of, the, of a natural system. Um, yeah, so next please. Awesome. So now we're gonna go into provisioning services. These are the goods we directly get from the environment. So when you're out in the environment, there's a lot of things that nature gives to, gives to society. In Colorado, these include wooden fiber, we are still a lumber state with active lumber management. And on this slide that I tried to show were all these big flat splotches, where you see the little white in this yellow circle, are areas of logging, where you see the trees and then the patchwork beneath. That's one service that the ecosystems provide. We can only grow good lumber in areas that are natural environments. We can't grow lumber that well on a farm because it needs natural environments to grow, compete, and get larger. Additionally, in Colorado, we of course have water. We have natural systems where the mountains come in and snow falls and then it melts down and comes to us. Like, and this is promoted by ecosystems and that kind of thing, where we have water cycling and water storage through, red, through ponds, reservoirs, conservation areas, wetlands, and things that we do to store water and keep it cycling through Colorado. Finally, one of the things that we don't talk a lot about in Colorado in ecosystem services in general, is the use of the natural ecosystem for food and grazing. For this, let's talk again about the Comanche National Grassland. In the Comanche National Grassland, we have cattle grazing on it. This cattle is then used as a food source for people. But the reason that Comanche National Grassland makes a great rangeland for cattle is because it's a natural environment with a wide variety of plants that cows can eat and grow and flourish. Awesome. And that's provisioning services. Okay, so now that we've covered the four major ecosystem services, we're going to actually transition 
Yes, I like to move when I transition. It makes it a bit easier to follow when we're talking about a different subject. Into One Health. So One Health will go into a bit of an introduction, as well as how environmental health has improved our health. So we're going to say next to go to the next slide. Awesome. So this is One Health, a collaborative effort of multidisciplinary working locally, nationally, and globally to attain ultimate health for our people, animals, and our environment. That's a pretty big word. So let's break it down into a very simple idea. It's the idea that these three circles, environmental health, animal health, and human health, are all tied together. And we've discovered that even more so nowadays, more and more we're figuring out that this is the true way that it works. Ranging how animal health with the emergence of zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19 and Ebola emerge from animals and then spread into people. We have how environmental health with water and trying to maintain water to different people and communities, as well as providing soil nutrients, which is kind of a strange topic to think about, with selenium and iodine deficiency are tied into human health. And of course, we have how environmental health and animal health are related by the environment playing a role in what animals eat, as well as what's surrounding. So really quickly, I just wanted to point out the sides. These are all the fields that have helped with One Health in some way. Ranging from human medicine, which of course is us, maintaining our health and understanding how we are related to health. Nutrition being how healthy we are through our diets and that kind of thing. A lot of different things like algae and that kind of thing have been discovered in natural environments that have actually helped us with our own nutrition. Pharmaceuticals being the development of drugs and vaccines. Veterinary medicine, which is my field, which focuses on animal health. We also have biomedical engineering, which focuses on how we can take research done in humans and transfer it to animals, as well as research done in animals and transfer it to humans. We also have epidemiology, which is the spread of diseases and epidemics and that kind of thing. And over on the other side, I like to call these our minor contributors, because these guys did a little bit without people realizing they're doing it. Anthropology and paleontology. Sounds like a weird thing to throw into an article on health, right? Because they're all dead. But we've used the research done with anthropology to understand how diseases have spread in the past. Looking at how in paleontology, we've discovered that diseases such as Mary's disease in horses has a prehistoric relationship to rhinos that have been exposed to volcanic ash. So we can actually prepare for horse injuries when volcanoes erupt by looking at prehistoric volcanoes. We see soil health and sciences look at how soils relate to our own health. Things like selenium deficiency, iodine deficiency, iron deficiency are all tied to soils and what we grow and how we grow plants in. Botany has played a huge role in environmental health, human health and animal health through the discovery of pharmaceuticals and medications in plants. We have conservation, which plays a role in environmental health because it's conserving the environment to allow us to learn more about it. Hydrology, of course, being water. We must know how water works in order to provide water to people. And finally, microbiology, where we've discovered medications, vaccines, and even, of course, the diseases themselves from microbiology. And that is the idea of One Health. It's a multidisciplinary approach to, to allowing all of us to be healthier and work together. So let's talk a little bit about this circle, the environmental health side. So, how does it even relate to us? I mean, there's a, ecosystems are very broad, they're large, and why does it matter to you? And this is where it comes in down to habitat corridors. When we're dealing with habitat corridors, what is a habitat corridor? Well, people often think a habitat corridor is just a broad landscape of land devoted to conservation. That's partially correct. But habitat corridors also work to throw in multiple different ecosystems habitats, environments, animals, small creatures, and that kind of thing into their systems. For example, in Fort Collins, we of course have our mountains to prairie um, habitat corridor north of us in Soapstone Prairie, where we see basically going all the way from the foothills down to the prairie, this large migration pathway, where we have things like elk that migrate from the mountains, come down to the prairie, we have towns and solitaires come down the same pathway, 
And this large landscape is a mosaic that allows scientists to research how animals behave in not just one set area, but how they behave on a large scale. This whole environmental corridor also helps us understand diseases and also helps us understand health and also gives us a lot of benefits. So going on to the next slide, we're gonna talk about some of the provisioning services first. So remember provisioning services were the ones that we are given from the environment, lumber, water. Well, when it comes to environmental health, environmental health has given us, and corridors have given us medications and what are known as genetic resources. Next slide, please. So I like to tell stories about this to make it a little bit easier to understand. The first one is one of my favorite stories stemming from soil science and microbiology, where a study of island soils and island microbes discovered one of the, one of the most amazing medications that we use nowadays to prevent tumor growth, as well as autoimmune diseases. And that is rapamycin, named after the island of Rapa Nui, or Easter Island, where it was discovered through soil samples underneath the Moi monoliths. Which is pretty amazing when you're thinking like, oh, wow, what are we going to find under there? I, I'm going to grab that little soil sample. Thank you. I'm going to just take this to my lab and see if I find anything interesting. I'll let you know later. Anyway, we use this a lot for autoimmune disorders and to decrease tumor growth. And the way that it works is it attaches to the, what's known as mTOR, which is a fancy way of saying mammalian target of rapamycin, which was discovered when they discovered rapamycin. Now, this chemical, this chemical is found in all of our cells and is used to determine how much our cells grow and divide. As cells grow and divide, of course, we get sometimes we have molecular issues that lead to cancer or tumors. They're just these abnormal growths of cells. In the same way, we have mTOR but autoimmune diseases are an abnormal growth of our immune systems that cause us to basically attack our cells. And one of the things rapamycin does is it works against mTOR, which is a chemical that does this. And by preventing that, it stops those pathways. The next chemical that I'd like to talk about, which is a fun one as well, is one that is very relatable to today, tag polymerase. No one of you guys, who here has heard of tag polymerase? Anybody? Besides the veterinarian, oh, we have one other person. That's fantastic. So tag polymerase sounds like a weird scientific spell, you know, like, what does that mean? Well, let me start off by saying it was discovered in Yellowstone National Park during an antimicrobial survey of one of the hottest environments in the world being the huge hot springs that are found there. And it was found in a bacteria called Thermus aquaticus. And this bacteria lives in super high temperatures and it can reproduce its DNA. So how does that relate to us? Who here has gotten a PCR test in the last year for COVID? Who here has taken a COVID vaccine? Okay. All of that research, all of that studies have been resulted from this little guy, tag polymerase, who allows us to denature DNA and glue it back together without, this, without having to remove it from the machine. Through this one enzyme, we have sped up the process of DNA testing, or what we know as the amplification of DNA. So that way we can amplify DNA, test for things like COVID, create vaccine, vaccines through the having enough DNA to actually formulate and create things, as well as allow us to understand genetics. PCR is one of the things we use to determine for, um, fertility and paternity and all of that. Um, yeah, I can go on an entire slide on PCR. I used to do PCR for a living. So I'm going to say next before I get to in top tangent. If anyone has questions on it, I will be glad to take on it after we get through the presentation. So next slide. So going on to the vaccine stuff, this is our next big plan. This is one of the weirdest things on planet Earth where you go, how did you find that? So there was a botanist back in the 1970s that was doing research on plants in Chile. And this one person was like, oh, this is a medical plant that we use all the time. He said, medicinal plant, huh? OK, my anthropology brain's gone. I'm going to take that with me and bring it back to the United States. He did. And when he did, he started looking into the chemicals in it and discovered that it contained what's known as saponins. So saponins are basically soaps. You know, they, we use them 
and yucca plants to clean ourselves and that kind of thing. But he took it to a pharmaceutical company that developed it into Quill A. So Quill A from this Quill A brasiliensis is a chemical that we call an adjuvant. We put it in vaccines to increase the effectiveness of a vaccine. They work by enhancing our immune response. The way I think about it is usually when you get a vaccine, it's kind of like your immune system's like, yeah, here you go. Okay, I got it, I got it. This is like the guy in the back ring holding the shoulders of the man, going, you got this, go for it, go for the gold. <laughs> and that's how this chemical works. It improves through the effectiveness of how we use the, how chemical, our DNA cells bind and they're like, ah, yes, I know how to fight that. So what has this been used for? Well, most recently it's been used in the COVID-19 vaccines, as well as in malaria vaccines and shingles vaccines. Mm -hmm. hmm? shingles. shingles is a big one. It was a big important plant, plant for shingles. Um, usually with shingles vaccines, we're unable to identify how the virus worked. Through this plant, we were able to increase our immune response to shingles and practically create a vaccine for the disease that never had a vaccine before. Um, next slide, please. So, now we're going to talk a little bit about genetic resources. And I'm going to keep this short in saying that the nature is full of amazing biodiversity. The more biodiversity you have, the more things we can use to understand of the current genetics of plants and animals. For example, potatoes, these are just a small variety of potatoes that are edible in South America. We have recently used these potatoes to create hybrids that are better suited for growing in colder climates, warmer climates, and that kind of thing by tying their genetics to the genetics of the common potato that we use nowadays. Additionally, back in the early, 18, early 1900s, we had the development of what's known as a beefalo, which is on the top, which of course is a bison-cow hybrid, which has been proven to be very effective in areas without water, and in areas that where there is a lot of need for cows to migrate long distances, because that is what bisons are bred to do. There is still research being done of whether this will work out in the future, and maybe we'll all be eating these bison hybrids, but who knows? It's been going on for a long time. But because we conserve the environment, we keep the genetic resource of the bison to see if we can relate it to it. Awesome. Next slide. How am I doing on time? I'm doing pretty good on time, actually. I'm doing better than I expected. <laughs> awesome. So let's talk about regulating services. So this was where we talked about fire and erosion and that kind of thing. But how does the ecosystem work to regulate your health? Now, this is kind of weird to think about because you don't go out into nature and you don't go into the prairie and go, see that plant right there? That plant's saving my life. I don't know how it's saving my life, but it's saving my life. But in reality, it is. And it's doing it through two different processes. One is known as refugia, and the one is known as dilution. So going on to the next slide, refugia is one of my favorite things to talk about. I'm a big parasite guy. I study parasites. It's one of the things I love to talk about. If you ask me any of the bird parasites, I could probably throw a couple out there. But one of the things we talk about with parasite control is that when you are back, when you are treating cows and treating an ecosystem for parasites, you never ever ever treat every single animal for parasites. Can anyone tell me why? If, if I'm looking at the veterinarian in the front row, um, <laughs> if not, I can explain. It's because the more that we use antimicrobials or antiparasitics the more that nature develops resistances. Mm -hmm. Who here has heard of the term superbugs? Mm -hmm. Diseases that we cannot treat through normal antibiotics or normal antiparasitics. One of the things that refugia does is it keeps what's known as a susceptible population in the environment. That's why we have these R's being resistance ones that are kept by disease. So the problem is that if we treat a cow like this and we get rid of all the susceptible ones, it's then fully resistant and gives birth to resistant offspring. Meaning that in enough generations, we get these parasites that we can no longer treat with the same medication. 
This is where the environment plays a role. The environment naturally has susceptible organisms in it. And this is true in any ecosystem. And one of the things we've been doing nowadays is looking at bacteria in ecosystems and developing what's known as a resistome or a genetic look at how resistance is forming with different parasites and different bacteria. We've discovered actually, which is really amazing, is that all of our antibiotics that we've been using, there are bacteria that are resistant to it naturally in ecosystems, even without human control. But the use of anti anti yeah, sorry, antibiotics causes those antibiotic resistant ones to spread, which causes them to be more resistant to future medications down the line. But if you give a section of susceptible organisms, those ones that aren't immune, they typically allow us to destroy it again. In English, it's kind of like trying to explain it the best way I can, which is, again, okay, it's going to sound weird. If you and your best friend wear a pink shirt, okay? But your best friend decides he's going to start wearing purple. And he gets everybody in town to wear purple shirts, and you're the only one with pink shirts. All of a sudden, if there's something that focuses on purple shirts and destroys all the purple shirts, completely killing them, what's left? It's leaving you with the pink shirt. Thus, you can be like, hey, man, you should have worn pink. And the pink resistant strain begins to spread. Now, on the other side, it will spread until it gets to a town where they're still wearing purple shirts. And the purple shirt guys are like, no, we don't wear purple shirts here. We don't wear pink here. Switch to purple. There you go, wear purple. Thus, by having a natural area, we, we help with the resistance. Awesome, next one. Now we're coming to one of my, this is actually a very controversial topic with numerous papers coming out in recent years, but I'm one of the people that believe in it. The idea is that the more biodiverse, the more species we have, the less likely we'll have zoonotic diseases. Now this is kind of opposite to the thoughts we had before, because when you have more species, it means that you can get diseases from more species. Like shouldn't, because we have elk, moose, bear and wolves, we should get diseases from all four of them? Well, not really. And that comes down to the idea of diffusion. So who here has used colored food dye before in a recipe? Okay. So imagine with me, if you have a water bottle and you drop one drop of blue food dye into the water bottle, the water turns blue. But if you were to take a huge bathtub and drop one drop of food dye into it, it kind of doesn't really change color, give or take, depending on how big your drop of food dye is. And that's kind of the premise of diffusion with biodiversity. When you have a large pool of biodiversity with many different species exhibiting and coexisting and predation and that kind of thing, they reduce the spread of zoonotic diseases by reducing the ones that are of greatest risk. So things like bats, birds, and primates, where we see most of our zoonotic diseases emerging are reduced by having wolves, owls, eagles, and bears. And by reducing this through diffusion, we don't have to kill all the bats or kill all the rats or kill all the dogs. I say that because there's actually a huge movie that just came out about two years ago about like, there's this huge contagion in dogs and they killed all the dogs in the movie. <laughs> um, but when you're doing that theory, it doesn't work out well. When you can have a natural ecosystem where, well, the mountain lion killed the diseased elk and that's where the disease stopped because they can't jump from the elk to the mountain lion to us. And that's a lot of how we work with it. So how does this relate to corridors? So next slide. So when we're dealing with this theory of diffusion, the biggest thing that we have to talk about is predation and long-lived species. We tend not to get diseases from predators and we tend not to get diseases from species that live a long period of time. And I mean, like when you think about a long period of time, think a mouse lives about two, two years maximum. 
while an elk can live to be 35 years old. Or if you're working in Africa, same hypothesis with the mouse, but an elephant, where the elephant lives to be 60 years old. You're dealing with these animals with longer lifespans, so they tend not to be able to die so quickly that they spread diseases and diseases are bouncing off of them into us. Now, corridors play a role because we have things that are predators that need a lot of space. This is a mountain lion. Next to it is the city of Fort Collins. The yellow borders that you see are a mountain lion's average home territory for a single mountain lion. That is 400 square miles. That is, as, that is the home territory of the average mountain lion. You can see that it extends all the way from Tin Mouth to Horse Tooth Reservoir, all the way north to Wellington, and pretty much halfway south to Loveland. Pretty amazing, right? Now, let's talk about our more disease risk guys. Next slide. So, oh, sorry. This is elk. This is another long lived species. Over here, this is a very migratory species. We see them migrate from Loveland up to the high mountains, and likewise from the mountains down into the prairies. Yellowstone has this really cool map. Who's been to Yellowstone? Wow, that's actually really startling. Okay, cool. Um, you can see that each of the different colors is a different range. And you know how big Yellowstone is. You realize that the migratory range of elk is massive. Now let's talk about those guys that give us diseases, those tiny little mice. That's the oval. And that little yellow square in the oval is its entire territory for its entire life. That is the average wild mouse in Fort Collins, our deer mice. In comparison, house mice and house rats usually live in a territory of less than 10 feet throughout their entire life. Pretty amazing to think about, right? So when you start taking away these large corridors for habitat to move and animals to live to, get, to have a large space to work in, you start shrinking it down to where only the deer mice and the smaller species can live. These deer mice are more of a short-lived species. Short-lived species tend to cause more disease just simply because they live a short amount of time, meaning there's more of them. And when there's more and more of them because of lack of predation or less competition from larger, larger, larger animals, it means that they're more likely to spread disease and have it jump into humans, leading to things like COVID, as well as many other diseases in the past. So, next slide, please. Where do we go from here? So, <laughs> I know I'm lazy. I like to sit down sometimes. It makes it a little bit easier. Next slide, please. This is where we talk about what you all can do. When we're dealing with habitat corridors, the best way to do it is through stewardship. You know, and when we talk about stewardship, we mean actively participating in environmental issues, actively conserving the environment, cleaning up after yourselves, leaving no trace, and all the beautiful things we do. Recently, Colorado has passed a bipartisanship legislation promoting habitat corridors in Colorado. They're being led by the Colorado Corridor Project, which focuses a lot on trying to prove scientifically that these corridors are being used and the corridors are beneficial to Colorado, as well as Colorado for Corridors, which focuses a lot on developing our interstates and these huge dividing lines through natural areas and human development into areas where animals can still migrate and move. So creatures like the mountain lion that needs the 400 square miles and the elk that have to migrate huge distances every year have areas they can go. And the more areas that they travel and more areas they have, the more that we can protect the natural systems from zoonotic diseases. We can have more dilution. Through the migration of these animals, we have more refugia. Because we have those pink shirts and purple shirts, moving from one area to the other. We have, through ecosystems, fire breaks, through the creation of habitat corridors, we have erosion and we protect 
we regulate, we provide all the different wood and water and all that, as well as we defend something that we truly love, something that we care about with the aesthetic appeal of nature, that we all take for granted many days when we go out on a hike. You don't realize that when you went out there, somebody had to take the time to develop it and conserve it. And with that, I will gladly take any questions. So what, what I'll let you do is take questions from the room. Occasionally, I'll look over to Andrew. Yep. Tell people to type questions into the chat window. Sounds good. So if you didn't hear John, John said, please type your questions into the chat window. If you're attending via Zoom, if you're attending in the audience, just please raise your hand and I will answer your question. If it's something that I cannot answer, I will gladly help to find the answer because that's the kind of person I am. <laughs> Nolan, what other famous corridors exist in the world? Ah, thank you, Karen. <laughs> so we had this in our podcast. Well, and the other... <laughs> oh, thank you. So one of the, the questions we first had was given to us by Kara, which is what other corridors exist in the world? So currently there are a lot of amazing corridors that are in development. In North America, we have the Yellowstone to Yukon corridor, which is one of the longest corridors in the world that's being worked on, where we will have the ability to extend the Rocky Mountain all the way from Yellowstone using parks, game reserves, and all the different means we have to conserve, extend it all the way up into the Arctic Circle, which is pretty amazing when you think about it. And it allows for a lot of different migratory species, such as wolverines, and to then migrate down, as well as wolves that are highly migratory as well, to travel large landscapes like they did in the past. Other corridors exist, such as in Africa, where we have the Transfrontier Corridors, which are united, united governmental corridors created by countries neighboring each other, meaning Zimbabwe, Mozambique, and South Africa, to create large expanses of corridors using game reserves, national parks, and various conservation entities to develop landscapes where borders and fences are no longer an obstacle for things like wild dogs and elephants and the migration things that happen normally in these ecosystems. One of the ones we talked about in our podcast, which is a still a developing corridor and is doing amazing work, is the Pampas to Patagonia corridor in Argentina, which focuses on connecting the rainforest in the north to the Antarctic Ocean in the south. And one of the things they're focusing on, which is really amazing, is that they're focusing a lot on birds and protecting the areas that birds migrate through their, through their country, including protecting one of our native birds, the Swainson's hawk, that nests, spends their winters this time of year down in Argentina. Awesome. Good question. Oh, we got one from the chat and I'll take John's. We, we have a compliment from the chat. Well done, Nolan. Great talk. Oh, yeah. Learned some cool things from you. Okay, cool. That was just thank you for the presentation. I really appreciate the thanks, by the way. John. Uh, Nolan, one of the things you didn't mention is um, the mitigation of air pollution. I did not. Um, is there anything you could say about that? There is. There's a lot I can say about that. So what the question was that I did not mention the mitigation of air pollution. That is one of the most amazing ecosystem services. And actually, it's one of the first ecosystem services we discovered. Because we discovered that if things like trees could take smog and absorb it into their system and pass it down into their roots, which then erupt with air quality in certain areas of cities. So places like New York City, where there was a huge smog, as well as areas of Chicago, had these trees that all of a sudden were turning black and gunky. You know, you get these paper birches that were black all of a sudden. And that was because they were actively absorbing the chemicals in the air and putting them out the Yeah, so 
Um, yep. Does that help with air pollution? I can talk more about it if people are interested, because there's a lot to talk about with that, because there's a lot of research out there for the ways that ecosystems have helped with air pollution. This includes things like being a storage unit for different things like nitrogen and carbon and storing it into their soils. We have the use of ecosystem use of air pollution. Um, there's some couple of really cool plants that have been planted in areas that are, have toxic chemicals near power plants and that kind of thing that have been used to absorb chemicals from chemical plants and actually put it back into the ground to prevent it from spreading to local communities. Also by growing it into their leaves and things. Um, yeah. Paul in the, the Zoom room is going to ask a question. He has his hand raised here. Cool. You can unmute him. Tell him to go ahead. Go ahead, Paul. Hello. Oh. Yeah. Can you hear me? We can definitely hear you. We're ready to hear your question. Okay. Uh, the late E.O. Wilson. Uh, was famously said that insects are the little things that run the world. So your whole presentation was based on vertebrates. And uh, insects are probably a lot more important than the vertebrates in the ecosystem health and in ecosystem diversity. <clears throat> Yeah, I can definitely talk. You about need it. to weave that into your uh, conversations and presentations. Yeah, I can definitely talk a little bit. I do, I don't really normally talk about it in the presentation, mostly because veterinary medicine focuses a lot on vertebrate science. So the question was talking about, well, what about invertebrates? Because a lot of my presentation was about vertebrates. Well, as you stated, Paul, invertebrates do run the world. And there are many ecosystem benefits that we gain from insects. Um, starting off off the top of my head that I know of are one, we have the degradation of natural materials that are left behind. In English, the best way of putting that is that when you take your dog out on a walk and the dog decides to do his duty somewhere, there's something there to clean it up and give a natural cycling of nutrients. That's one way that insects have helped. Additionally, insects have helped a lot with the understanding. We don't really receive many diseases from insects. You can't really get sick from insects. There's been nothing that we found where diseases spread from insects to people or insects to other animals. But we have found that insects play a very key role in plant health, where diseases are spread from insects to plants, as well as being insects being vectors for diseases. So, yes, there's a difference between disease directly and vectors. So insects are an important vector species, where a lot of diseases that we have, such as West Nile virus in Colorado, is a disease that is spread from birds to people and horse and to horses through mosquitoes. It's one of my favorite diseases because technically it's not a disease of the local mosquito population. They get it from our migratory birds that travel to South America got West Nile virus, flew up to North America, got bitten by a mosquito in North America, and that same mosquito bit a human or a horse. Super fascinating stuff. Um, because it doesn't last in mosquitoes, it dies off in mosquitoes after one generation, which is not that very long for mosquitoes that usually only live two to three months at the maximum. So that's one. In South Africa, insects as vectors have played a role in where horses could live because of diseases such as African sleeping sickness or trypanosoma cruzi, which affects horses so much that the horse basically dies within 24 hours of being exposed to disease. And it's only spread by one species of fly in Africa. And that one species of fly lives only in this one, in, only in the tropics. So it's really fascinating, but horses only spread to the edge of the Sahara in the north and South Africa going north. The other one, before European colonization, there were no horses. Besides zebras. Sorry, zebras are fascinating because we found out recently that the stripes of zebras is actually used to prevent the bug bite that leads to African sleeping sickness. 
because the color of stripes of the zebra confuses flies and prevents them from landing on the zebra. How was this discovered? It was discovered by a guy from Oxford who decided to go down to Africa with his horses and paint them the color of a zebra. <laughs> and discovered that they didn't get a single bite from the tsetse fly. Um, huh? Pollination is one of the big ones as well. Ecosystem services, when we talk about insects pollination, a lot of the plants that we use in agriculture are pollinated by local bees and that kind of thing. In fact, one of my favorite facts is that apples, in general, apples as a plant can only be pollinated by native bees. Our normal honeybees actually do not do apple blossoms that well. It is go beyond the point. So, yeah, there's so many amazing ecosystem services, and we we could talk for hours and hours about the amazing things that animals are doing around the world to provide benefits. We, if we just go to the ocean alone, you can do the same presentation with habitat corridors and the importance in the ocean and have completely different ecosystem services. Ultimately, however, though, when we're dealing with ecosystem services, they come down to that supporting service that we talked about in the beginning, which is biodiversity, photosynthesis, and nutrient cycling. The more biodiverse the landscape, the more, e the more wet, better it, that better, uh, more easily it allows for nutrient cycling, as well as the more that photosynthesis can, can occur, which it leads to things like air pollution, where they need photosynthetic plants to absorb that. Photosynthesis also works by providing all the food for all the rest of the biodiversity to grow. So as long as you have those supporting services, you can come up with amazing ecosystem services along the way. And there are way more than I could possibly cover in this meeting. They're fascinating things. And the relationship with One Health is also something that we're still working on trying to understand. There are a lot of people that can play a role in ecosystem health. Yeah, yes. hmm? uh, can play a role in One Health, either through trying to promote it within your own field of science, as well as telling other people that they should start thinking about ways that they can relate their field of science and their goals into creating an area where we can affect, affect human health, animal health, and environmental health. Because ultimately, anything can be one health. And I say that very loosely because I run a club that does that a lot, where we have to tied one health to paleontology. We've tied one health to, um, recently we tied it to space travel and tied it to, we had a NASA speaker come in and talk to us about how one health is used in space by looking at mice to determine how humans will adapt to space travel. One Health is one of the most fascinating things in the world, as is ecosystem services, and I'm glad I could have educated on that today. Are there any more questions? I'm down to take any more. I love questions. Questions are the way that we learn. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I have oh, a mute. I have a question. Uh, I make a lot of monarch presentations. And in my presentations, I talk about the monarch migration paths and about creating way stations. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, I, I just came in on the tail end, I guess, because I had to go to another meeting. But have you heard about the way stations and that we need to provide the monarchs with nectar sources on their way down and back again? I have actually. Um, the way stations are actually a project that I'm currently working on with veterinarians right now, with one of my fellow students, JC Serta. Um, we're currently working on trying to promote people and the pamphlets for veterinarians for them to develop way stations on top of their own veterinary clinics. For those of you who don't know, we're talking a little bit about monarch butterflies and the need for way stations. Monarch butterflies have one of the longest migration pathways of any insect where they migrate all the way down to Mexico and all the way north up into Canada. Now, this migration has been greatly affected by humans in the past, and it's one of the reasons that we need to develop corridors for insects like this. Now, one of the things that we've discovered as well is by defending butterflies and creating these monarch way stations, we develop pollinating areas for bees and other insects to receive the same benefits as the monarchs in their pathway. 
So thus, we not only promote a large scale monarch migration, but as well as promote the natural ecosystem and the natural pollinators currently living in our area. Um, let's see, I was going to, monarch butterflies also play a role in vectors as well, though they play a minor role. Um, because they act as kind of a way of controlling um, certain bird populations. Because certain birds that are unused to seeing monarchs, like birds that are migrating from South America their first time around, it's their first generation, they were born in South America, they're migrating up. They see a monarch, they don't realize it's poisonous, they eat the monarch and die. That's one way that they do it. Um, it's a version of, not predation, but it's a version of poisoning that actually is beneficial for disease control as well. Um, anyway, yes. Hi friends, uh, this is Kara Madsen, I'm the professor collaborator with Nolan this semester. Um, and I just wanted to put a little plug in for our vet cast. There is um, an episode actually about monarch butterflies and then um, that how their migration has been impacted by human actions. Um, there's also a bunch of other really cool topics. I know you guys are mostly birders, but um, you know, if you have ever heard of heartworm, there's an episode on that. There's an episode on brachycephalic dogs, so those cute little bulldogs that have their faces squished in. Uh, there's an episode on them, and um, I just encourage you to check it out. Can you tell the name of the podcast? Uh, Vetcast. So it's V E T. C A S T. The episodes are only about 30 minutes long. So it's a really easy thing to do on the drive to work or in the shower or wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. Um, one of the other ones that I recommend reading about is our Blue Green Algae podcast, which talks about the emergence of blue green algae in Colorado. Um, if you haven't heard, blue green algae is now officially in Colorado. It is an algae species of cyanobacteria that is very toxic to dogs and very toxic to people. It's, a, it's basically my public safety speech of, please keep your dogs on a leash in air, natural areas. We put up those signs to let you know that there's potential for your dog getting sick. Awesome. I don't know if you're a, a butterfly expert or not, but I, I just noticed this year there wasn't as many butterflies in my yard. And is there a reason? For, I, I mean, there was hardly any. And maybe it's just me, but I've planted a lot of butterfly kind of bushes and only saw some swallowtails early on and then just hardly anything else. Yeah, so we've had, this has been a kind of a routine thing that's happened this year, where we've had a decrease in butterfly and bird populations. Um, we don't know why this is, and I don't know if anyone in the audience knows any better than I do, but one of the things that we kind of thought were maybe just we had a weird off season with temperatures and migration, you know, because when you're dealing with butterflies, you're dealing with a species that needs a certain, is used to levels of humidity that are pretty normal and used to these different aspects of nature. And then we might just be having an off year. Um, again, this is one of those things that we might have to look at longitudinally to understand better what's going on. It might take a long, basically that means you might have to wait a couple of years to understand if there actually is a trend in butterflies. I know that there were there have been butterfly surveys here in Fort Collins that have seen lower numbers this year, as well as um, as field trip coordinator, I've gotten numerous emails about birds being in low numbers this year, and I've talked to a lot of professors that are doing the research and are finding pretty low numbers of the passerine varieties. Not so much necessarily the large eagles and things that we really regulate because they're endangered species, but along the line of songbirds, we've kind of seen a weird decrease. So I'm sorry that I don't have an answer to your question, but I was hoping it wasn't just me. <laughs> <laughs> it is not just you. Okay. Um, yes. Anything else? Thank you.